Well, um, we're uh, finishing up Ephesians 4 today, if you can believe that. And uh, if, if you've been around, or maybe you're, you haven't been around Hope City, uh, we've been in this journey through the book of Ephesians for, for a while now. And, and maybe you're like, well, John, what have I missed? Um, well, you've missed pretty much everything, okay? And I'm not, I'm not really even trying to be hyperbolic. You literally have missed everything that Jesus has done. And now we're in the place where we're just trying to get busy living that out. Now, because I don't want you to feel left out, I, I want to just sort of catch you up if I can. And, and what that means is this letter that we're looking at today, written by a guy named Paul, the apostle, uh, written to a church not too dissimilar from ours, and it's written after the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the, the first three chapters of, of this letter, this book, uh, is life-changing. It literally takes our identity, when we trust in God through his son, takes our identity, our ambitions, our deepest affections, and he turns all of those upside down. In fact, let's just go back to Ephesians 1 for a second. Let me show you this marker that we've been holding on to this entire journey. Here, here's what it says. He says, Paul, this guy who wrote it, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. So just imagine you're getting a letter this week at your mailbox at one, two, three, Featherwood Lane, or wherever, wherever you live, and the letter is titled to Samuel, a saint in Tuscaloosa, or to Lauren, a saint in Tuscaloosa, or to Jimmy, a saint in Tuscaloosa. You might get that letter, and you might be disoriented because you're like, I don't always feel like a saint. Or you might be like, I don't always behave like a saint. And, and Paul's like, I know, isn't that amazing? I mean, isn't that powerful? Meaning you did not behave your way into sainthood. Right? You were graced into sainthood. Meaning when you stepped into sainthood, it's only because God the Father tethered you to the work of his son, who is the savior. Let me say it this way. When Jesus died on the cross, and if you're new to church, like that, that's the centerpiece of what we're celebrating. That's why we spent 30 minutes singing about his death and his resurrection. But that's the centerpiece. But when Jesus went to the cross, one of the things he was doing for us is he was canceling the debt of our sin, which means he was clearing the slate for us. So when he died and then he rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, that same spirit that caused him to rise from the dead now lives inside of us. And that spirit now gives us infinite power to live contrary to our former way of life and, and to have a kind of power that we get to live differently than any other person on planet Earth. And so a few minutes ago when I said, you missed everything, <laughs> I wasn't really kidding. I mean, like, chapter one, he's like, you were chosen. You are a son and daughter of God. You are forgiven, redeemed, restored. There's a destiny in front of you. Chapter two, he's like, the grace of God is at work in you. Faith has been activated in your heart. And hello, it's not your faith. You didn't work that up. It's a faith that has been gifted to you from heaven. And then we just kind of stumble into chapter three and we are so full, we are so encouraged that so much so Paul by the end is like to him who is able to accomplish more than we ask or imagine. And then we run right into chapter four. And if you've been with us, it's just filled with application. That's all it is, which makes sense now. And the reason is we've gotten it up here, gotten it here, that we are saints. We are forgiven. We're sons, daughters of God. We are redeemed. God is restoring us. We are made new. We are given a new name. There is a destiny of sorts from heaven put over your life and over my life. And because of that, God's like, now I want you to go live like that. Let me put it this way. Um, when you and I step into the family of God, and, and again, like, that doesn't happen because of you. The only way we get into the family is because Jesus opens the door for us. But when we get into the family of God, when we're, when we're members of the kingdom of God, the values of the kingdom of God are the primary things that inform the way that we live. 
right? The primary ways that informs the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we treat other people. And, and so it's sort of a, a new norm for you. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, how many of you, when you're growing up and you, like you were a teenager and you were going off the rails or you were, you know, is way, I would say with my kids, like you're acting a fool. When you were a teenager and you were acting a fool, how many of you, your mom or dad would like grab you by the ear and be like, oh no. No, like we don't, we don't act like this in this house. Right, anybody? Am I? Okay, like, yeah, it was like, hey, Buster, we don't talk like that in this house. Hey, Missy, we don't, we don't speak to people and speak about people that way in this house, right? And, and, and again, we didn't know as children, but we get it as adults now. And what we understand is that in every house, there is a norm. Like in this house, this is how we live. In this house, this is how we speak. In this house, this is how we treat other people. And so from God's perspective, he's like, hey, there's a new norm. You're in the family of God. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are being restored. There is a destiny, something that, that's a fingerprint of heaven on your life. And because of that, he's like, I, I want you to live in a way that is congruent with that, with the kingdom values that have been put inside of your heart. Yeah. Right? And so with that in mind, Paul he knows that's what's happening, so he puts on his exhortation hat, and he just, like, gets after it. And that's where we're picking up today as we finish chapter 4. He says this. We're beginning with verse 25. He says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So let, let me say this. Uh, Paul, what he's about to do and what he's, he's doing is he's giving us a truckload of commands. And I know this is, it would typically not be the, the most exciting sermon to be part of. But he, he, let me stop and just say this. Because all these commands are here and it's easy for us to sort of turn off. Because we're like, yeah, I don't do this and I do do this. But, but he, here's the thing. It's helpful just to remind ourselves that of all the commands we're about to read to the very end... You and I, in our own power, in our own agency, in our own strength, you and I cannot and will not obey these commands. I, I think that's, that's like the good news today. Like you, you and I are unable to obey these commands. And, and that's a, an indicator of like when you're outside the family, you don't have any other strength except the strength of the earth. And the strength of the earth is just not enough for you. And so when you and I are given a new identity in, in the Son, meaning we are now in the resurrection, Jesus being the firstborn of the resurrection, and you and I being the second and third and you know, t -t millions after of the resurrection, when that is who you are, in the Son, in the resurrection, there is now the very spirit that caused him to rise from the dead. That spirit lives inside of you. And what that means is this, is now you and I have a power outside of ourselves that lives inside of us, and it's now given us the power to choose. It's given us the power to be able to choose not to sin. Let me say it this way. Um, how many of you have ever, maybe you know somebody, don't, if they're here, don't look at them, but how many of you have ever, have ever met somebody that is sort of a, a cranky, curmudgeon of a Christian? I mean, and I, I, may, I don't know if they're Christian. I like, you just like people that complain all the time. Anybody like that? I'm the only one, okay? I'm just going to start calling names, okay? Um, yeah, of course. We've all been around people. It's like all they do is complain. All they do is whine. And, and what you find, if you listen closely, the curmudgeons in the faith, they always seem to be complaining about the world, right? I mean, like the world, the world. It's so worldly, you know? And, and they're the kind of people like, oh, like they, they're constantly parroting news and constantly parroting how terrible the world is. It's like everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, it's awful. And they're the kind of people, you're in the car and you're like, how do I get out of the car? Like, I, they're, they're going 50 miles an hour and you're going down, you know, the, the strip and, and, and they're, they're watching students go into the bars and they're like, those dirty, rotten sinners. And in a, in a right place, you're like, I mean, yes. Like, they are sinners. What do you think sinners do? <laughs> they sin. Okay, yeah. And the reason is that is their identity. So whatever your identity, whatever my identity, we're going to naturally live into. That's the bent, that becomes the bent of our heart, the bent of our emotions, the bent of our ambitions, our affections, is based on our identity. 
But check this. When you and I come alive in Christ, when we are given the new identity of Christ, of his resurrection, we're given a new identity, new ambitions, new affections, new direction, new dreams over our future. When, when you and I are given that new identity, our identity does change and it changes in such a way where we realize we have been given power where we don't have to sin anymore. I'm not saying you won't sin. I, I, I mean, right? I'm assuming, like we, most of you have probably already sinned this morning, right? Um, getting, you know, kids into the car and you're driving to, to, to church and you're like, I taught my child a cuss word this morning, right? Like you, you have sinned maybe, okay? But, but because we have the spirit of God, we now have power where we don't have to live into that former way of living. We don't have to live into our identity as sinners. And reason is like, Paul's like, you're a saint. The spirit of God who caused Jesus to rise from the dead, who overcame sin, now lives inside of you. So with that in mind, it makes a lot of sense that Paul would be really liberal with his commands. And the reason is he's like, now you have power to obey. Before, you couldn't. But now you have the power to obey. So th with that in mind, I don't want you to feel the burden of these commands. There is a delight because you and I have power to obey. Here's what he says. We're going to jump back to verse 26. I know we covered these two verses last weekend, but I want to read them just in the context. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Okay, so the, the best that we could do before the Spirit, the best we can do without the Spirit is just sort of clean up our mess. Right? He's like, if you steal, if you lie to people, if you do damage in your relationships, he's like, the best you can do is just like pay back restitution and just sort of like hope things work out in your, in your, to your advantage, right? He's like, that's all you've got. He's like, but now that you have the spirit, you actually have a power that you didn't have before. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. Genesis 4-7, uh, and if you're memorizing scripture, I hope that you are. Um, I memorized this one out of the NLT, which I've never done before. I, most of the verses I memorize are the, are the NIV 84, which is the translation Jesus used. Um, but, <laughs> and if you're new to church, like I'm just talking, these are translations. It doesn't really matter. Like whatever translation you use is the right one. Okay. Whatever one you'll read and you'll obey is the, is the right one. Okay. But, uh, the NLT of, of Genesis four, seven, I love it so much. It says sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Okay, so the question you got to answer is this, is how in the world do we become the master of someone that has enslaved us or something that has enslaved us our entire life? Yeah. And the answer to that question is you get a bigger, stronger, better master. You get, thank you for that. I, I'm, I, I'm loving this little corner right here, okay? You, you, you get a bigger, stronger, better master. His name is Jesus. And the reason is that if you and I try to subdue our sin in our, in our own strength, in our own you know, power, our own agency, if we try to do that on our own, it's going to do one of two things. It's either going to produce a self-righteousness where you're like, I'm amazing. Look, look how I'm checking off all these lists. And you become a kind of person that, that nobody wants to be around. You don't even want to be around you. Let's just be honest. Or, and this, this inevitably happens, self-righteousness will always lead to a kind of self-hatred because your sin will crush you and you will feel like a failure. And so the only option we have to overcome our sin is to have a greater, stronger master. His name is Jesus. So with that in mind, again, let's just keep going. He gives these commands to obey. And again, we have power for this now. He says, let no corrupt talk or corrupting talk come out of your mouths. But only as such is as good for building up, encouraging other people, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So let's just do an inventory. He's like, don't, don't, don't let your anger control you. Don't steal. You should work. No more corrupt talk. So, okay, he's talking about holiness, right? Anybody? Yeah. He's talking about holiness. Um, So here's the thing about holiness. If, if, if you're, when you think about holiness, and the only way that you think about holiness is that God is just trying to make you more of a moral person. 
Like meaning like the goal of holiness is, is God trying to get you to stop doing some things and trying to start you to, to start doing some things. Like, you know, stop stealing, start working, stop lying, start, you know, start telling. Like if, if you think that is the goal of holiness, then if, if you think that's the primary goal of holiness, then you've only got a one-dimensional view of holiness. You've only got to, and I'm not saying God doesn't want you, like, of course, does God want you to steal? Does he want you to lie? Like, no, of course not. But that's actually not the goal of holiness. The goal of holiness is, is yes to those things, but ultimately his goal is for the spirit of God to take control over our life. That we begin to see him in, in a way that we've never seen him before to do things and move in ways and move us to places, to places of risk, to places of obedience that we never thought possible before. L let me put it this way. When, when Jesus was on the earth. He, Jesus was the, the holiest person that has ever lived, okay? And what that means, it, I mean, it's 1 Peter 2, 22. No sin, he had no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth, meaning Jesus was perfect. He wasn't just a person that behaved in a holy way. Jesus was holy. That's who he was. And yet here's what's really interesting. One of the titles that is given to him is he's called the friend of sinners. Okay, so he's holy, meaning he, he is walking in holiness. He is perfect. He is preaching holiness. He requires holiness. And at the very same time, he, that holiness is creating an appetite in people that are around him, that are far from God, that are called sinners. So what, what that should tell us is that holiness, real gospel holiness, should not be off-putting to those that are far from God. Actually, holiness, real holiness, should actually have a kind of beauty. Holiness should have some sort of attraction to it. It should have an orbit where people that are far from God go, that's, that's beautiful. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't have a metric for it. But that, the beauty of the way that you're living your life by a power that is, uh, is foreign to me, that kind of life of flourishing is, is so beautiful but still very foreign to me. I want to be part of that. Here's why I, I go to that idea of beauty. Listen to, to one theologian says it this way. I love this. Um, he says, holiness is an expression of the beauty of God. So this week I was, um, I was with some, some pastors in North Carolina. We, this is the sixth year we've, we've done this retreat. And so every morning we're, we're usually up pretty early. We watch the sunrise. We're watching sunset. It's beautiful. And as I'm watching the sunset, like you, I'm watching it and I'm like, man, God is so creative. He is so, the, the very fact that he cares about, he's not just creator, he cares about beauty. Yeah. I mean, just think about this, that, that if he, he, he likes light, but he also rules darkness. If he, when he wants the sun, to, the, 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 the day to be over, God could have just installed a cosmic light switch. He could have been like light, dark. Light, dark, but he doesn't do that. He, he's, he's a creator that cares about beauty. And so he installs this landscape for us to go, wow, the beauty of God. The beauty. Of, so it, it tells us a couple things about holiness. One, and I, I want you to hear this. Holiness is always uncompromising. If God is holy, it means that his holiness is uncompromising. It, it's, it's who he is, meaning the values of the kingdom. If you're part of the kingdom of God, the values of the kingdom of God, because they are the primary ways that inform the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we think, the way that we dream, talk about our future, because it's informing us, those values also come in, in opposition to the values of the world. And so we have to go, to be holy is often to stand in opposition to the values of the world. It's okay for that. God gives you grace for that. But the, the backside of this is the reminder that the holiness of God is a component of his beauty. So again, look, look at the quote. He says, holiness is an expression of the beauty of God. God's inexpressible, eternal, and perfect beauty is expressed imperfectly, but still supernaturally through the holiness of, of the people of God. That he's, he's talking about us. And so the beauty of God is expressed in a very distinct way as you and I step into the holiness of God. We make God look as good as he really is when we stand on his promises, stand in his values in a world that is increasingly getting darker. Okay? So that, that quote leads us right into the end of the text. Let me finish this way. Verse 30. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me, I want to just give you two, two thoughts, and then I want to drill down just for a couple minutes. Uh, so just a reminder, the Holy Spirit's a person. Like, the Holy Spirit's not an it. He, he's a he. Um, he's not a subjective reality that's somehow tethered to the Trinitarian nature of God. Like, he, he is a person. And because he is a person, he is fully orbed in his emotions. And so when it says he can be grieved, he says, don't, don't grieve him. But it means he can be grieved. It simply means that he feels deep feelings over you. The other thing, though, that I want to highlight is when he says, don't grieve him, we got to ask the question, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? Now, depending on your church background, um, we, I think we've been really sloppy with this. So guys like me or guys like you, people like you, I often we're like, okay, well, I think what that means is we don't want to disappoint God. And, 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 and the reason we do that is we impart our values on the kingdom of God, not the other way around. And so the, 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 our values, if you're a parent, it's, you've probably used this, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed and ashamed of this, but um, as a parent, my, my children are all grown now, but when my children were little and I would go past anger, I would press the nuclear option, and I'd be like, I am so disappointed in you. And, I, and again, I'm ashamed of that. that is, and the reason I'm ashamed of that is because when, when we use that language, disappointment is always tethered to shame. It's always, it has this expectation that you better behave this certain way to get my approval. And so it's tethered to my dark heart. It's tethered to their dark heart. And the reason this matters is like God can never be disappointed with you. If you're a son and daughter of God, he can never be disappointed with you. It is outside of his nature. And the reason, here's why, and there's a, there's a lot that goes on to, if you're interested in the doctrine, it's called the impassibility of God. You can Google it later, okay? But it simply means this, is that when God looks at you, he firstly sees the perfection and the perfect work of God, the perfect work of his son, his holiness on your life. And so at the very same time, because he's God, he can see two things at the same time. He also sees the imperfect way that you and I are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. But he firstly and most importantly sees the work of holiness in your life. Jesus is perfectly sustained in you. He sees you, he sees holiness. He sees you, he sees righteousness. He sees you in spite of your dumpster fire of a day this weekend or this last week or this last month. If you know his son, then he sees you as holy, accepted, son, daughter, forgiven, cherished, loved beyond all possibility. That's who you are. And so you got to ask the question, if grieving the Holy Spirit doesn't mean he's disappointed, what does it mean? Here, the way I would read this I think it means it's an ache. It, it's a, it's, it's a, because he is a he and he has full orb emotions, it means that he hurts over your sin. Like my kids are grown now, and, and I don't think either of them are in this gathering. It's, I think it's the next gathering, so I can say this in this gathering. My children are old enough in, in, in life that we are not actively parenting them the way that we did when they were 10 years old. But they make decisions as adults now that we know that those, those decisions are not going to work. And because we have not been actively invited into that conversation, all Amy and I can do is, is just ache for them. Now we pray our guts out. But in, in our own, in, in us, all we can do is just ache and go, you know Jesus. You have the power to choose. Why would you choose that? Now, my kids are not making black tar heroin, by the way, okay? They're, like, you're like, what are they doing? Like, they're just doing dumb stuff the way that we do, right? There are people that grieve over me and grieve over you, okay? But I think that's what, when it says the Holy Spirit grieves, I think he, he looks at us and he says, listen, you've been, he knows what we just talked about. You and I have been given power by his Spirit. It's living inside of us. We now have power to choose. And he's like, why would you choose sin? Why would you choose a thing that's going to destroy you? When you have life and flourishing. Let me end this way and because and I'm out of town, time. No, I'm just going to finish. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, 
I can send you my notes later, but we just, I want to make sure we have time for prayer. Um, let me, uh, why don't we stand together? And uh, I want to invite Will to come on up. I was really excited about that last part, too. <laughs> Listen, I, you know, we'll see. No, we, I, uh, I want to I wanna honor those people who are coming in the 11. So um, he, here was my sense as I was praying before the gathering. Um, many of you walking in shame today. Like you, you, you look at your behavior and you hear what God says about you and, and this is what you do. Stop it. Stop. That's, I, I, I know that's what you say. And what you've done is, is you've, you've rejected the, the promise of God over your life and you, you believe the lie. The lie is that you're not, you're not worthy. Now, in, your, in, in who you are apart from Jesus, none of us are worthy. But in the family, in the son, in the resurrection, you are loved beyond the cosmos. And so just today, I, I, just the sense is that God, he wants you to hear today that you're cherished. I want to invite our, our prayer team to come up. And um, he, here's the thing. Um, To hear that word, to hear that, that idea of like you're cherished is one thing, but, but to have it go down deep and set you free from shame, to set you free from an identity that is not the identity that God has, has secured for you on the cross, to walk in that identity requires a work of the Holy Spirit. Like, it's just, it's not enough just for you to like, I'm going to chant this over myself, or I'm just going to keep quoting it over myself. No, like... You, you, you need the work of the Spirit to, like, just break through that, that wall that you've built up of, of identity. And, and I'm telling you, when, when you and I walk, when it goes down to those deep places of, of knowing that we're cherished, we're loved, it has nothing to do with our behavior, has nothing to do with what we do, has nothing to do with what we don't do, has everything to do with what Jesus has done, it moves our hearts it, it, it's hard to like not just weep in worship. It's hard not to, to have our hearts melt at the needs of people. And so, Father, would you just even now, just a violent wind of grace over this house. Just chains that were have been bound in shame. Would you just break those even now? We're gonna sing a song. Why don't you come? Why don't you come get prayer? Our our, our heart here is that you would have an experience, uh, uh, an encounter with the God of the universe. He loves you. He's for you. And sometimes you just need other people to pray for you. Sometimes it, it just doesn't feel like it's enough when you just pray alone. I mean, it is, but sometimes we need other people to come alongside and just agree and to hold on to us and shout down the lies.